Amen. Amen. Brother Joe, can we? Um, yes, sir. Thank you. You may be seated. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And let me know when you're live on the internet. Oh, well, hey, guys. Hallelujah. Good to have you with us this morning. Praise the Lord. Uh, we are continuing on our series on uh, the purpose of the baptism of the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost. And if you were with us last week or you picked it up online, you know that we were ministering on tongues last week. And um, it being the, the, the speaking in other tongues is the initial and actually ongoing evidence of the infilling of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. And we'll receive the offering at the end. Don't let me forget, Joe. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh, and so we spent time with that and showing, and I do believe that uh, the way we taught that last week, uh, you can't really argue um, that when you receive the Holy Spirit, you speak in tongues. That's true. Also, that the, man, that the uh, experience of being baptized in the Holy Spirit or filled with the Holy Ghost, hallelujah, um, is not the same as being born again. We covered that last week. We also covered that one of the ways that people are able to receive the Holy Spirit is having hands laid on them to receive the Holy Spirit. All that was covered last week. And I believe we laid down a good, solid foundation for that um, for, e for people maybe who didn't grow up Pentecostal or charismatic. Hallelujah. Uh, we, we laid that out from Scripture. Amen. And that, listen, we have to base it on the Word of God. We cannot base experiences reality by our experience. Does that make sense? Did I just lose you? Or is your all's head spinning? Okay. Uh, example, about 30 years ago, a big thing started going through the church called warring tongues. Okay. People would gather together, sit there and scream for hours in tongues. And, you know, they were doing warfare against the devil. And, they, and then they started teaching that in churches. On, based on what? There's nothing in the Bible that teaches warring tongues. Okay. As a matter of fact, the, 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 we find out that, you know, tongues is for edification and strengthening spiritually, um, that pr privately praying in tongues is communing with God. In services, it is for exhortation. It is to give forth that with an interpretation of tongues, and we're not teaching the gifts of the Spirit right now. We, will, we do, but we're not going to do it right now. It's equal to prophecy, okay? Prophecy being inspired utterance by God. Hallelujah. Tongues and interpretation of tongues in church Okay, equals giving something in prophecy. Okay, so the interpret now it's not the translation; it's the interpretation. Okay, it takes the essence of what's said in the spirit and put into the language of the people there who are in that service. All right, we find nothing about about warring tongues. Now, do I believe that you could have an experience with God that you're doing spiritual battle against something in the spirit, praying in other tongues? Yes, I believe that can happen. But we can't teach this doctrine to do it. Does that make sense? You can't, I can't. Well, I, had, I did that. Well, that was an experience. But I don't have Bible to teach you that we're all supposed to be doing warring tongues. Okay? You may, experience, you may have that kind of experience in the Spirit. There are things we can have in this experience. You can't go out and teach it as doctrine for people to, other people to follow. Amen. In the same way that, well, let me just give you this example on, on, a, complete, on a different level, but it, it, it will parallel, okay? We've heard, you've heard me tell the story about that Dad Hagen used to tell about the oil guy, okay? Yeah. Now, he was, oil, he, he was at a, like a full gospel businessmen's meeting, which was a huge thing in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, a demon Shakirian, and, and there's all these businessmen who had gotten filled with the Holy Ghost, charismatics. They were staying in their liturgical or whatever churches, but they all come together in fellowship. Right? They were filled with the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. And so this guy was giving his testimony. And um, he was an oil guy. And the Lord spoke to him one day and said, uh, I want you to go drill over here on, on the land that he had either leased on or he was, it was his. And I want you to drill at a 45-degree angle. Okay. And you'll strike oil. So he goes to his foreman and uh, he pulls out the, the geological and says, I need for you to drill right here. And not only that, I want you to drill it at a 45 degree angle. And the foreman starts arguing with him. There's no oil there. We've done all the studies. There's no oil there. And they, they go back and forth. And he finally says, 
I'm the boss, I'm paying the money, you drill. And they strike oil. Well, God speaks to them again. He says, go over here and drill here. He goes back to the foreman, same thing. Drill here, 45 degree angle. He said, and they go through the same argument. I'm the boss, you're the foreman, do what I say, drill. Oil. And they do this about two or three times, about three or four times, and then the guy comes in and goes, where do you want to drill next? Because they're striking oil every time. Well, he gives his testimony. And sitting out there in the um, congregation, or the, where the meeting, whatever you want to call it, is another oil guy. He said, well, if that worked for him, it would work for me. God's not a respecter of persons. He went out and started just picking places and saying, drill at 45. Went bankrupt. Why? Because you can't teach what the experience and what God told him to do as a doctrine for you to follow. Now, you can follow how he got there. What do you mean? Praying and spending time with God and hearing the voice of God. But you can't teach how he did what he did as a doctrine. So you can't go teach your experience with things in the Spirit as doctrine and tell everybody else to follow exactly that. Okay, now listen, we're going to come together. You're going to get in there. You're going to fight the devil in tongues. You can't teach that. Because I got scripture that tells me what you're really supposed to be doing is communing with God. Now, led by the Spirit in, that, in a time of prayer, and you go in that direction, you're led by the Spirit, then that's an experience with God that is something that, that happened because you were following God's Spirit. See, what can you teach? Follow the Holy Ghost. See, out of that you can get follow the Holy Ghost. You can't get, we're all supposed to get together and scream in tongues for three hours. Because you don't have Bible for that. I do have they that are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. Amen? So you see the difference? We can teach what the Bible says as doctrine and what everybody is to follow. We can't teach our individual experiences as doctrine. Because God may not lead you to do that. Hello? What, what am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to follow the Holy Ghost. I get led by the Spirit. He may tell you to do something. To, he, may be, he may be with you, and you're in prayer, and you're speaking and praying in the other tongues, and all of a sudden the Spirit of God speaks to your heart and says, stand up and declare this. And, it, and everything changes. And, and somebody hears you say that. Bless God, I'm going to stand up and say that. Did God tell you to do that? Hello? Then what do I do? You get into the Spirit, and you pray, and you seek God until He tells you what to do. That's the part you can follow. That's the part you can teach, because that's what the Word says to do. Y'all here? You gone home? How many are still here? Okay, Den Dennis finally figured out he was here. <laughs> I'm messing on Dennis. You're, you're, my, you're my fall guy right now. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. So y'all still here. So understand that we're going to have experiences in the Spirit. We're going to have encounters with God in ways that Dad Hagen said this. When he, when he, um, he had, a, um, had an encounter with God that was so supernatural. Actually, it was when he, 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 he died and, and came back three times. For years, he couldn't talk about it. He didn't run out. He, he couldn't even share it because he couldn't talk about it. It was so deep with God and such a heavy experience that he, he couldn't even talk about it with people. And finally, one time he was teaching ministry and he began to share that experience. And his mama was listening on the radio. And when he got, saw her the next time, she said, Kenneth, let me tell you the other side of that story. But he'd gone years and couldn't and never shared it. You know? I mean, I've met people, you know, I, I saw an angel, an angel came and said this to me, and somebody goes, that wasn't an angel, that was Jesus. He changed his testimony based on what the other guy said it was. If, you, if it was Jesus, you would know it was Jesus. Hello? You, if Jesus appears to you and starts talking to you, you are going to know it's Jesus. Amen? Especially as a believer. Even the Apostle Paul, when he was a little bit unsure of what's, what's happening here, went, who art thou, Lord? <laughs> okay? 
We don't see anybody going to an angel. You're Jesus. No? All right. So, um, tongues are an important part of our growth in the Lord. But also, you know, there's, there's things we, we address about misuse or, um, and let's face it, when you get loony stuff going on, it messes up for other people. Amen? Now, we said last week, when Shekinah Glory gets here, there's going to be dancers out, and we need to open the door and let them run around the building. Well, David danced before the Lord with all his might. Amen? Uh, he even wrote a psalm, says, I can run through a troop and leap over a wall. Amen? So there are, there are the, some of those things that we, we talk about that we Pentecostals took a bad rap for, you know, rolling out the front door, hanging from the chandeliers, uh, you know, rolling up under the pews and all this kind of stuff. Um, it's just people would, didn't understand, and nobody ever taught. I mean, that was, it, it was such an experience when they got filled with their Pentecost that they kind of stumbled out of the upper room, and everybody thought they were, well, most people thought they were drunk. Thought they were drunk. Well, how do drunk people act? Not like their normal self. So just watch out. Well, I'm not much of an exhibitionist. Holy Ghost is going to get a hold of you. Hallelujah. He's he going to shake you. We had a guy in our church that we were in Greenville. Uh, him, his wife was a, had actually signed with Sparrow Records. And um, you know, she, they were going to use her as a lead for, to try to get her career going. And sweet couple, precious couple. And um, now he wasn't spirit-filled. And one day the pastor was ministering and, and uh, asked anybody who wanted to be filled with the spirit, come up front. And he thought, after he'd been around for a while, he thought, yeah, I, I do need that. He said, but I am not falling. I am not going down on the floor like all these other people do. I ain't doing that, you know. So he comes up and pastor lays hands on him. And the next thing we know, we're sitting out there, and we see him go, boom. <laughs> and afterwards, he tells us, he said, well, I was standing there, he had his hand on me, and I kind of glanced down, and my feet had come up, and my toes were touching my shins, and I just went, boom. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Another guy one time said this. He was, you know, he's, his wife was Pentecostal. He'd go to church. He was Christian, but he, he, he didn't believe it. He went into that speaking in tongues stuff, all that Pentecostal stuff. But his wife went to church. He went to church with his wife. And, um, and he'd say things like, I'll tell you one thing. I'd rather rip the carpet up at the back of the church and climb under it than to speak in tongues. Well, by and by, over time, God began to minute, talk to him, and he, he, finally, he started as we call it in Pentecostal circles, seeking the baptism, you know, to go ye into Jerusalem and tarry there until you be endued with power from on high after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And so we, we spent a whole lot of time seeking. It took us some, some folks years. And he, he'd go to the altar and pray, oh, God, I want, I want to be filled with the Holy Ghost. And he'd pray, and nothing was happening. And so one time he's in prayer down at the altar. I guess he had gotten to the point he was just, I, I need this. And, and God says, you remember what you said? He jumped up, ran back, and actually tore the carpet off the, uh, the pins and crawled under and came out the other end speaking in tongues. <laughs> God's got a sense of humor. I said, God's got a sense of humor. He just, you know, don't say what you're not going to do. Because I guarantee you, if it's God and it's Bible and you say you're, you're not ever going to, eventually you're going to. And God's going to get a, have a, a little bit of a laugh about it at the same time. Look, he's got, he's, he's, he's not stoic. He's not stoic. God, where do you think humor came from? You know, not ungodly humor, but humor. God created us with humor. And he, I bet you he gets a kick out of some of us. All your proclamations about everything you know and everything you got under control and all that kind of stuff. Um, he'll, just, he'll get the last laugh, I guarantee it. Hallelujah. So, we've established that, that being filled with the Holy Spirit is not the same thing as a new birth. We've established that the initial evidence of that is speaking in tongues. It's amazing how much is in the New Testament about speaking in tongues, particularly the book of Acts, and then Paul's letter to the church at Corinth, that the church today disavows speaking in tongues. In so many circles. There's a lot written. Amen. There is correct. There is, you know, showing that it's in the, in the New Testament. 
Hallelujah. Okay. But we see from scriptures we shared last week, that was the initial sign. And it really is the ongoing sign. Paul says, I speak in tongues. I speak. Not did. I do. More than you all. Literally all, more than all of you put together. Um, we established that you can be filled by laying on of hands. Hallelujah. And um, then we, just get, we got doctrine about speaking in tongues. Not just that it is the sign, but there is a purpose to that. And we want to start in on, some, on that today. Um, I, let's look at this. And first, I say, let me say this. Praying in tongues brings, number one, rest. Now, we're not talking about, we're talking about spiritual rest. Yes. Amen. Isaiah 28, 11, and 12 says this. For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people, to whom he said, this is the rest wherewith you shall cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. Now, look at here, let's, let's understand. <coughs> I love this, because people want to just, like, eliminate the Old Testament. That was just for the Jews. Where, what did Paul quote when he was quoting Scripture? To, to undergird his teaching in the New Testament? He quoted the Old Testament and brought light to it. Um, this little saying you could kind of put down somewhere, the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed the new testament is the old testament revealed okay in the old testament it's it's it's, it's concealed we don't but in the new testament through through revelation god unveils what he meant so if you read that you'd be going well, what does that mean well then first corinthians paul's writing remember this is his, his one of his chapters uh, th uh, 12 and 14 are written um as instructional and corrective and, you know, revelation about tongues. In 1 Corinthians 14, 21, In the law it is written, With men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people, for yet all that they will, no, they will, not, they will not hear me, saith the Lord. Hallelujah. So, here we have it. What does it do? Well, according to Isaiah, it brings rest. Praying in other tongues brings rest. Yeah, but I don't understand. We're in divine communication with God. Um, I think actually, let's go to First Corinthians fourteen. Uh, we're probably covering some scriptures we've already read. Covers, you know, but um, understand this is Paul writing to the church. Hallelujah. He says something really interesting. I, I believe in First Corinthians, the first chapter. Um, but we'll just have to find that later. He says, you come behind and no gift. You come behind and no gift. Bill, if you can find that, that'd be great. Hallelujah. But he gets it, you know, he gets into here. He starts in chapter 12, talking about, you know, spiritual gifts, etc. Goes to chapter 13 and talks about walking in love. And that simply is, is as the quote came out last week about service, um, having power and authority and having not love is useless. Okay. So 1 Corinthians 1, 7. It's always the first chapter. Uh, so that you come behind and no gift waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul, Paul used the technique of complimenting, slamming, and then complimenting. <laughs> he starts you out good, blister you, and then come back and make you feel good before you leave. That's how Paul did stuff, you know. I mean, oh, ye dear idiots of Galatia. I mean, that was in the slamming stage. Amen. I'm going to tell you, Paul would probably not be welcomed in a lot of churches today. They pick and choose in his writings. But if he showed up and really told you what he thought about something, it wouldn't be all hunkadory. Well, who does that little short, bald-headed man think he is? Only the chief of the apostles. Hello? Jesus appeared to him, gave him a mission. Hello? We, we have from his, history and some internals from the scriptures that Paul was probably a bald little short guy. He didn't care. Amen. But then we get in chapter 14. Okay? And um, Paul goes, you know, he really gets uh, speaking in tongues, et cetera. Verse 1, follow after charity. Now, we understand charity is the Greek word agape. 
okay, which means unconditional, the God kind of love. And desire spiritual gifts. Now, again, gifts is not in the Greek. It is there because it's, it's in italics, meaning added by the translators. It literally means desire spirituals. Spiritual is plural. Things and of and pertaining to the Holy Ghost. We, w we should desire the things of the Spirit. Amen? Your walk with the Lord is not a religious duty or a religious um, identity. It is to walk in the Spirit, walk in the things of God. God's called us to something higher than a natural life, and we have a religious satisfaction to fulfill, so we go to church. Now, whether it's a, a evangelical-type church where we show up because we show up and we're, we're on the women's auxiliary, we're doing something really great, or in the liturgical church with the responsive readings, et cetera, um, you know, uh, the, all, the, all the different styles, it is still not about having this segment of our life that is relegated to this is my spiritual experience or my religious experience really and this is what we do uh, to satisfy that need to be religious it is a communion with the most high god it is walking with the most high god it is fulfilling his desire for your life fulfilling his purpose for your life which is greater than what you see in the natural. And if you relegate everything to, oh, I, got, I got this natural life, I fulfill my religious duty on Sunday, da 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 you're missing the whole boat. Hello? God wanted to have fellowship with us and communion with us and have us live out our life the way he designed us to live it, which is in the Spirit. Yes, we have a natural life, but it is to be governed and regulated by the Spirit, out of the realm of the Spirit. Amen? Hallelujah. So let, let's go ahead here. Follow after the God kind of love and desire things and of the Spirit, but rather that ye may prophesy. Now he's going. To, now here he is. He's in the church, and he's trying to correct in a, in a really clear manner, the, the need of the church versus your personal desire to, to do spiritual things, you know. And what the problem in the Corinthian church was, they all tried to scream and shout and talk in tongues all together um, to the point nothing was getting done except they were just over there being happy. When we come together, uh, that you can have times of joy and happiness and have ministry, but we have to leave with something that takes us higher. Amen? And, and other than being the one who spoke in tongues more than anybody else in church service. Okay. Um, he that speaketh an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him, howbeit in the spirit he speaketh mysteries, divine secrets. Okay? Masterion. M-A-S-T-E-R-I-O-N. Masterion. Divine secrets. He that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself. But he that prophesieth edifieth the church. Now here we are. This gives us clarity. This is in reference to a church service. This is not your personal life. When you're praying in tongues in your personal life, you pray all day long. In the church service, what was the, what was the purpose of gathering together? To edify the church. So everybody speaking in tongues... And nothing else happening, who gets edified? The individual. The group doesn't. Amen? If I came here this morning, opened up and said, open up your Bibles, and then I started speaking in tongues, and at 12 o'clock I said, okay, guys, we're done. Let's go home. Now, probably someone there, I'm dancing and shouting, woo, God's good. And you're out there going, well, pastor's getting blessed. I wouldn't mind having some of that. Hello? But I didn't learn a thing today other than the pastor knows how to get happy. Does that make sense? See, it's not beneficial to the church that we all come together and we just, all we do is speak in tongues. I mean, if you walked in this morning, somebody greeted you and you shook your hand and they were speaking in tongues to you and you're going, oh, okay. <laughs> now, good morning, how you doing? 
Hope you, you know. Yeah, are y'all here? I would that you all speak with tongues. Now, I prefer that you all speak with tongues. Okay? But rather that you prophesy, for greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues, except he interpret, that the church may receive edifying. All right. Here we go. So, instead of all of us speaking in tongues at one time, during the church service, you know, now listen, if we're worshiping, that's one thing, but I'm talking about when, when we're supposed to be ministering to the congregation. Unless you interpret, we don't need to be doing all that. You know? You don't need to stand it right, like right now. Sister so-and-so back in our home church was saying that right now and just go off. And of all the times she ever did that, she may have been, I may have recognized that it was a spirit once or twice. Because 95% of the time at minimum, it was flesh. It wasn't the Holy Ghost, you know, because you could feel the cold water poured on the whole congregation. It's supposed to edify, not put out the, put out the fire. <laughs> all right? Um, so, Prophecy, in other words, speaking the language of the people. In a service, this is not a general statement against your private prayer life when you're by yourself or you're in your prayer closet. Hello? It is about a church service where people are ministering the Word of God. Well, it, if, it's the Spirit, if it's the Spirit, He'll do all things decently and in order. Hello. Amen. You know, you just don't stand up and interrupt whoever's speaking, speaking in tongues. Well, who are you to say it's not God? The one in, in, in the Spirit of God has in charge at that moment? Now, I know for a fact because I've been in the services. You can be have somebody ministry, and they'll stop and go, somebody's got something from the Lord. And if you've got something on your heart, oh, that's it. <laughs> Amen. But you don't interrupt. And then, of course, you don't have the whole church interrupt and start just speaking in tongues and interrupting who you're speaking. Because they're teaching, or the, you know. They step, you know, you, you can be ministering and step over into prophecy. And, that, you know, and you don't have to say, yea, thus saith the Lord, for it to be prophecy. I've, I've preached, and I know when I step out of, you know, just the unction to preach and be fervent, and I've stepped into prophecy. You, there's, there's a difference to it. You, just, you, can't, you, can't, you can't find, um, what's the word I'm looking for? I can't find words to express the, what happens, but something's different. It's the spirit. It's different. It's just totally different. I mean, I've been teaching. You know, you can teach and be prophesying. You don't have to, you don't have to, you know, be all exhilarated for it to be prophecy. I like that. I prefer that. I love. So y'all really haven't seen me, you know, most of y'all. Well, most of you, some of you have seen me get into that flow. I love to preach I mean cover you and spit four rows back <laughs> there ain't nothing like it <laughs> for people receiving either <laughs> but just know it's anointed spit <laughs> Jerry's thinking about moving to the back row <laughs> that's still four rows <laughs> glory to God <clears throat> but I can tell you there's a difference when, when prophecy you step over into prophecy you're speaking not what you've studied and what you've prepared for, which is, is anointed. But you're speaking at a sudden inspiration of the Spirit what He wants to say. <coughs> that was not a prophetic sneeze. Okay. So, 
as we continue reading here. Now, brethren, if I come unto you speaking with tongues, what shall it profit you, except I shall speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge or by prophesying or by doctrine? Now, what's he saying? Again, now you walk up to somebody and just doing tongues for 20 minutes and then walking away, what did you do for them? Well, they got a spirit. They can Paul said, if it's ministry, we need to interpret. If it's a ministry, we need to interpret. However, if we're praying in the Spirit, what are we doing? We're edifying ourselves. Amen? Even things without life, playing, giving sound, whether pipe or harp, except for they give a distinction in the sounds, how shall it be known what is piped or harped? Um, for the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? If so, likewise, except ye utter by tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? For you, are, you shall speak into the air. See, we're, we're, we're getting here where Paul's really trying to distinguish between ministry with tongues and personal edification with tongues. And there is a difference. I said there is a difference. So in order to edify the church, prophecy is preferred, except you interpret the tongues, which equals the prophecy. Okay, there are kinds that may, it may be so many kinds of voices in the earth and none of them is without signification. Therefore, if I know not the meaning of the voice, it, I shall say unto, it shall be unto him a barbarian. And he that speaketh unto me, a barbarian unto me, even so for as much as you are zealous of spirituals, things of and pertaining to the Holy Ghost. Listen to this. Seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. Notice, he, he's basically commending them for being zealous of, the, of, of spiritual things. But then he says, but let's get the attitude right and the heart right and the purpose right. But seek to excel at edifying the church. So you have this moment that you can either just speak in tongues and Nothing helps anybody else or, in that same moment, edify the church. Well, see, well, you've gathered together to be edified, to be strengthened, to be comforted. Amen. Wherefore, he let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. Why? Previous verse, seek that you may uh, edify the church. Seek that you may edify the church. Amen. If we're doing congregational worship and people are praying in tongues or singing in the spirit, and it, you know, and it's it's just a time of individual. It really is. It's corporate individual worship. It really is. It's, it's not. You know, it's everybody coming together and getting into the to one place of heart united worship to God. But it's still individual. You're not addressing anybody. You're not trying to address anybody. You're just worshiping God. Okay? No problem with that at all. Amen? Hallelujah. Um, for if I pray, and I know it's not in the Greek, so if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prayeth. Now, the Greek uh, Amplified Bible says this. Amplified Bible says, my spirit by the Holy Spirit within me prayeth. Okay? Well, wow. remember they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Okay, my spirit by the Holy Spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. What's that mean? If you're praying in a heavenly language or you're praying in, oh, check. You don't know what you said. Hello. I said, hello. Your mind's going. And I'm telling you, sometimes your mind will go, what are you doing? Because you don't understand a thing you said. But my spirit is in communion with God, spirit to spirit. And I'm receiving spiritual things that will be digested and brought out through my human spirit and to my mind over time. Paul said that when he was caught up into the third heaven, 
He heard things unlawful to be uttered. What was that? His epistles. It took him the rest of his life. He said that they couldn't bear it. He took him the rest of his life to write out what he saw in heaven, the new creation man. And it had to be digested and brought out in ways they could handle it. Amen. So when we get in communion in the spirit of God, we digest things out of the spirit. And then and your mind might not be ready to handle stuff. Because your mind's used to all kinds of other things. Like, if I can't see it, I ain't going to believe it. Amen. If I can't touch it, it ain't real. Amen. All right. What is it then? Now, Paul asks, he's being rhetorical. He's asking himself a question. If I pray in the spirit, my spirit prayeth. But my understanding is unfruitful. So what? What is it then? What, what about all this? I will pray with the Spirit, and I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with the understanding also. Now stop. And what did Paul say he would do? So all the stuff he's already set up now, you, people could be going, take any of those verses out of context and run off with it. See, Paul don't want you. He doesn't want you praying in tongues. That's not what he said. As a matter of fact, he said, I will pray in the Spirit. I will pray with my understanding. I will sing in the Spirit, and I will sing with my understanding. Amen. Else, when thou shalt bless with the Spirit, how shall he that occupieth the room say of the other and say, Amen, at thy giving of thanks, seeing he understandeth not what thou sayest. For thou verily givest thanks well, but the other is not edified. We keep coming back to this edification are y'all here of the church so this is talking about gathered assemblies of believers and our desire in that position at that time in that moment is to edify each other or to edify the whole not just to get personally edified can I get a holy grunt maybe a couple of holy amens now, if you're, you're kind of struggling, just go, help me, Jesus. Okay? All right. This is the next thing. I thank my God I speak in tongues more than you all. Now, I've already quoted this a couple of times in the past couple of weeks. Greek structure here says, Paul said, I thank God I speak in tongues more than you all, or all of you put together. He's talking to the church at Corneth. Remember? The one he's having to correct for everybody speaking in tongues all at one time in church services and not getting anything done. And he said, I thank God I speak in tongues more than all of you. Or all of you put together. Okay? Yet, in the church, I had rather speak five words with my understanding that by my voice I might teach others also than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. Now stop. I've heard preachers get up and say, Paul said he'd rather speak five words with his understanding than speak 10,000 words in tongues. That is not what he said. You have mischaracterized what he said. I've heard it preached as reasons we shouldn't speak in tongues. He clarified, straight up, yet in the church. Now, we say before that, I mean, can I kind of go non-King Jimmy? Okay. I mean, King Jimmy's great, but let's, let's do non-King Jimmy here. Guys, I want to tell you something. I am the tongue talkless individual you've ever seen. Amen. I thank my God speaking tongues more than you all. All of you put together. That sounds so sweet. And King Jimmy, a nice, nice, I'm sorry, 1611 King James Version. The authorized version. Did y'all know it was never authorized? It never received its final stamp, stamp of approval. So it's the mostly authorized version. Uh, these are all titles we put on this, these things, okay? You know, 1611 KJV is from me. You ever seen those hats or shirts? Yeah, got, got to be the 1611 KJV. And you can't even read Jimmy Ran Up the Hill. And you want to read 1611 King James Elizabethan English. All right. Paul says, man, I am a tongue talker. You guys ain't got nothing on me. All of you, all of you put together can't outdo me with tongues. That's what he said. And there's one little bit, 14, 18, that little bitty 
small, long, small length verse. He's telling them, I am more tongue talking than you, any of you, or all of you put together. I am a tongue talker. Then he comes back with yet. However, in the church, okay, now. So where does this apply? Does it apply at home in your private life? In the church, I'd rather speak five words with my understanding than 10,000 words in other tongues that what? The church might be edified, okay? That by my voice, okay, by, by my voice, I might teach others. He wanted to be able to teach. He wanted to be able to strengthen. He wanted to be edified. So when he was gathered together in the church, he wasn't trying to, and see, Bible interpretation, you've got to know who it was written to, why it was written, and when it was written. We're talking about a first century church. We're talking about people who are zealous of spiritual things. But it's like a, a, a kid with a new toy. They got this new spiritual thing going on, and they don't know what they're doing with it. They just think, whoo, this is awesome. And so Paul had to write a corrective letter and deal with the misapplication of a true biblical experience to bring order to it so that it was a blessing and not a hindrance. Amen? Now, in doing so, he's trying to walk that, strike that balance of not going to the other ditch. Amen? Amen? He corrects the misuse in the church and doesn't keep, keep other things in line. They'll, they'll just you'll jump in the, well, we can't ever speak in tongues. That's just wrong. That's wrong. Tongues are wrong. Paul, Paul chewed us out. So he comes back and says, look, guys, I'm a tongue talker. You can't match me. But when we come together, Man, I'd rather speak 10,000 words with, I mean, five words of my understanding than 10,000 words in tongue so that I could teach you something. All right? Because in this moment in time, I don't want to show you how much I can talk in tongues, which I do a bunch of. Okay? So don't go over here and get in this ditch trying to get out of this one. Let's not flip over to the other ditch. But I can, I can teach you something that can, you, you can use in your faith walk and in, in, in your understanding of who you are in Christ. So when we come together and I have an opportunity to speak into your life, it's not going to help you a bit if I do it all in tongues. I mean, I'd rather take five words and make one statement that could change your life forever. Now, five words is not, you know, it's obviously not a hard set He's trying to, he's making a parallel there. He's not making a, you know, well, five words are better than 10,000 words. No. In this setting, his rathers would be, I want to be able to teach you. It's not about, at that moment, it's not about him being edified. It's about having the opportunity to edify the church. Unless you interpret Amen? Uh, the Copeland said this. I can't remember if it was Gloria or Kenneth. I think Gloria maybe said it years ago. Um, when you're talking to people and trying to, you know, trying to help them or minister to them or whatever, talk to them that, like they believe like you believe. Okay, it was Gloria. I thought it was. What do you mean? Don't hem and haw and try to back up and try to you know, placate and you know, act like, well, they don't believe like I believe. So, so just talk to them like they believe like you they believe like you believe. So you're freer to share with the excitement and joy that you have about the things you've learned from God. Instead of going down to their level of don't believe nothing. You know, the unbelieving believers. They don't believe nothing. They're a Christian, but they don't believe nothing. Hello? They don't believe in miracles. They don't believe in the supernatural. They don't believe in the devil. They only, they're not even sure if they believe in heaven. I mean, you know, all kinds of stuff. We call them unbelieving believers. 
God can, but he never does. Well, certainly God can heal, but he never does. <laughs> it's only, you know, um, he's using that to teach you a lesson. And he said, he makes an extra sta extra, <laughs> interesting statement right after this, brethren. Be not children in understanding. Now, how be it in malice be ye children? But in understanding, um, turn too quick. Be men. And then we read our verse we already read. In the law is written, I speak unto this people. Yet for all that they will not hear me, saith the Lord. Wherefore, tongues are for a sign to them that believe not that believe um, not that to not to them that believe, but to them that, pro that believe not. But prophesy and serveth not for them that believe not, but for them which are believed. Okay. And we're not going to read the rest of all this, okay? Um, now nah, I better. For the whole, therefore the church come together into one place, and all speak with tongues, and there come in those who are unlearned, unbelievers, will they not say, you're mad? But if they all prophesy, and there come in one that believeth not, or one unlearned, he is convinced of all, he is judged of all. Thus the secrets of his heart are made manifest, and so falling down before his face, he will worship God and report that God is in you of a truth. How is it then, brethren? Again, a rhetorical question. When you come together, every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation. Now here. Here's what Paul's getting towards. Let all things be done in edifying. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two or three at the most, or, or the most three, and that by course, and that one interpret. Again, this is not talking about we're worshiping God and we're all, speak, we're all praying in tongues or singing in tongues. This is talking about people addressing the congregation. You stand up in the middle of service at a, 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 a time that would be in the flow of the service, and you go, Everybody's listening. And the next guy over here goes, and the Lord says, and gives the interpretation. Now, you shouldn't have 45 people doing that in the service. He says two, maybe three mm -hmm. in one service. Mm -hmm. Okay? Again, what, what are we talking about? The order of a service. See, people take his passages out of here and use it to argue against speaking in tongues. Blanket. And they're just wrong. That's not what he's doing. All right? Um, but if there be no, no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church and let them speak to himself and God. Let the prophet speak, listen, two or three, and let the other judge. Don't have 45 prophecies. Same rules he placed on tongues and interpretation, he placed on prophecy. Didn't he? Two or three. If anything be revealed to another that sitteth by, let the first hold his peace. For ye may all prophesy one by one, that may all may learn, and all be comforted. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. Now, I've shared this before. I'll share it again because it really fits here. We can all prophesy one by one. Now, I know, I know a group that took that scripture out of context, and they would line everybody to build up and have a personal word for them. The entire building. And go along and give a personal prophecy to everybody in there. Well, that's not what he was talking about. He's saying we can all we could all prophesy. Okay? Everybody could. He was telling, if you've got some, wait, let someone else do it. You know? So it's not a race to be the one that does it. Okay? To be everybody, I'm the prophecy guy. You know. Yeah, did you hear what I said this morning about, you know, that I gave out that word this morning? Yeah, probably you and not the Lord. Some of y'all get that in five minutes. The light will go off. Amen. I shared this before and I'll share it again. I was at um, Winter Bible Seminar one year out in Tulsa. That is back in the 90s. And, um, now, back then, now if y'all if watch Rhema Church now, and the, you know the platform's this huge platform, and, you know, and it's it's like they have the, you know their, their worship guys come up, and there's like you know, maybe ten people up there, then they all walk off. Well, when they built the building, they had a choir loft up there. It sat a thousand people. 
just the choir loft. Okay? So the building held 6,600 people with the choir loft. And, of course, they got the, you know, the balcony and they got the downstairs. So they, but, and over time, they took that out. It, you know, there weren't, many, there weren't as many people coming after Dad Hagen passed away. And, um, and so uh, they, they did, you know, for visual, not to have it looking like it's empty or whatever, they took that out and just made it a big platform. Cool platform. It has lifts. They could drop the whole um, instrumental group right down into to a room below, and they could all walk off and go into another room in, behind the stage. Really cool. And um, but I'm there now. The building is full. Choir loft is full. Copeland's up there. Jerry Savelle's up there. You know, I mean Fred Price. You know, all the all the guys were all out there, and they're sitting up in the choir loft because that was the guest ministers. You know the the bigger guest minister speakers got to sit up, got to, people got to sit up there. Cool. So I'm sitting out there. Oh, maybe six rows back on an angled side. He had two centers and he started with the angle and then went around to the, like this on the bottom floor. And I'm sitting back there. I'm on the end row. And uh, I'm looking up there during, during um, worship. And the word of the Lord for Kenneth Copeland came to me. I'm like, Wow, how am I going to give this word? I got a word from the Lord for Kenneth Copeland. Now, Mr., who are you? Now, you understand the big meaning you approach the platform? They don't know why you're coming up there. They have Green Beret ushers or red coat ushers. I mean, they all wore, they all wore matching coats in those days. Tonight we're wearing red, tonight we're wearing blue, you know, that kind of thing. And um, if I go, I, I've seen him in action. And I really didn't want to be taken down on the way to the platform to get the word to Copeland. Just be honest with you. So I'm sitting there arguing with the Lord. How in the world am I going to give this to Copeland? And it's staying there. Man, it's strong. I got a word for Kenneth Copeland. It's just going off in my head. Yeah, he just say it the Lord. Da -da 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 -da. I'm like, oh, my God, this is a great word. But how am I going to give it? And I'm out there struggling. I mean, I'm struggling. But I got a word. I know I got a word. Then I'm trying to convince myself I don't have a word. You're making this up. Okay? And so I'm out here in a battle. It's all going on. Everybody's like, ah, hallelujah. And I'm out here going, oh, my God. Oh, my God. I'm going to be in the papers tomorrow. I mean, <laughs> lunatic congregate arrested for Approaching platform at Raymond. You know? Well, Brother Hagin comes up and takes over the service. He's up there about two minutes. And he, he stops. He turns around. Kenneth Cup is on the very front row of the, of the choir loft. And he said, Kenneth, come here. And I went. Whew. And he began to prophesy over him exactly what I was sitting out there with. And I'm going, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. I mean, all those thoughts of getting tackled, you know, arrested, drug off by screaming, but I got a word for Copeland. I got a word for Copeland or something. You know, this whole thing's played out in your head. It's exactly. See, there can be a, the Holy Ghost be a manifestation, and we all are sensitive. Everybody, you can be sensitive to the Spirit and hear what God's saying. But then somebody gives that word, and you're going, yeah, that's exactly what I had in my heart. That's God. So you all could have prophesied it, but you didn't have the unction. That's the thing. We have to let those with the unction give what God has. Although any of if you're picking up in the Spirit, anybody who picked up the Spirit could have said what they heard in the Spirit. But without the unction, it's not going to have the effect. Amen. Amen. And so, uh, but what I did learn was what there was this. I was assured I could hear the voice of the Spirit. I, 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 wonder, I learned something in that moment that I know the voice of God. Because 
I trusted Dad Hagen. He, is a, he was a prophet. He was a prophet and a teacher. He used to say he was a teacher and a prophet. The Lord corrected him and said, no, you're a prophet and a teacher. He had it backwards. I went, I learned today. One of the things I learned is you don't act without the unction. Although you knew what it was, you didn't have the unction. Kenneth Cuff may have heard, I may have started yelling that out and saying, Brother Cuff, the Lord says, da 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 da. He could have gone, okay. Dad Hagen saying it. Complete different. Well, that shouldn't be. People are people. Whatever Brother Hagen prophesied to carry more weight than what Ed Taylor, unknown, the unknown minister. Kind of like the unknown comic on the gong show. Just put a bag over your head, be the unknown minister. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right. Um, the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. God don't make you. Amen. For, listen to this. God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as is in all the saints, churches of the saints. And then he goes on to talk about the woman question here. Um, we're not going to get into that this morning. All right. Verse 37. If, if any man thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let, acknowledge, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. Now, Paul really puts the pressure on them. Okay. You think you know something? You, you, you think you're a prophet? If you're really one, you'll know that what I'm saying is right. If you really are a prophet, you'll know what I'm saying is right. That's what Paul said in modern English. That the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. But if any man be ignorant, <laughs> let him be ignorant. If you're stupid, just stay stupid. Or learn. Or learn. Wherefore, brethren, he's gonna sum, he's gonna summarize all he said. Covet to prophesy. Oh, here comes all these anti-tongue talkers. And forbid not. To speak with tongues. Let all things be done decently and in order. Covet the problem. Why? He told you that you can identify the church. But he wants to, he wants to give his last parting shot on this whole di dialogue. Forbid not to speak with tongues. Don't go, go in the other ditch. I did a lot of correction here. I brought, explained some things here. But don't go be a bozo. Let the bozos be ignorant, or let the bozos stay bozos. Okay? Don't jump over here and, and, and take this to the other extreme and start forbidding to speak in tongues. You're wrong. Covet the prophesy, because you're going to edify the church. But don't forbid speaking in tongues. Why? The Spirit of God knows people, uh, human nature. In human nature, they don't like the middle of the road. They like ditches. I don't know why that is so. In a car, they don't like a ditch. But on opinions and views and narratives um, <coughs> and Bible doctrine, they like ditches. It's over here or over there. There ain't nowhere in the middle ever. You're either Armenian or uh, Calvinist. Hello? You know, sin one time, Jesus comes back. You are going to hell. Been in ministry 80 years. Don't matter. You're going to hell. Over here, you got saved. You can be the biggest uh, whoremonger on the planet, but you're going to heaven because once saved, always saved. Those are what? Extremes. They're ditches. Just be a Calmenist because the truth is in the middle. You are secure. You are secure in your salvation with the Lord. But you know what? You can reject him. God did not take away your free will. It wasn't when you got born again, you lost your free will. Amen. But it's also that if you, if you sin, the Bible says in 1 John that the blood of Jesus continually, it doesn't say King James, but in the Greek it says continually cleanses you from all unrighteousness. So you, I mean, can you imagine? Jesus, they're about to blow the trumpet. Hello? And I'm standing here like this, and Benny has to decide, also he's got to go to the bathroom. So he stands up and steps on my foot. And it hurts really bad. So I use a cuss word, which I don't do, but I did at that moment. 
And right as I do that, the rapture takes place. And I see everybody's gone. I'm thinking, oh. And I hear a sound from heaven. Sorry, you sin. I came back. You're going to hell. That's an extreme. Okay? For some reason or another, we like to get on narratives and get to extremes instead of getting in the middle. Okay? Paul's correcting misuse of tongues, but knowing nature of humanity by the Spirit of God, he, he says, now, I want you to covet the prophesy. I want, uh, he, he, let me, let me okay, re, 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 reword this. Have the heart to edify the church. But in doing that, don't go to the extreme that now you're going to forbid people from speaking in tongues. Amen? Hello? We don't believe in speaking in tongues. We might offend somebody. Oh, so you don't want them to have what you have to make them a help them be a better Christian and pray things out in the spirit. And I did cover, I did say it was rest, and then I got off on all this. We'll get to it. Uh, when we start this, so we're trying to find out if we're going two years or not. <laughs> no. All right. So our, our what is what is our purpose in a church gathering? Edify one another, to edify the body, to strengthen the body. Amen? But does that mean we can't speak in tongues? God doesn't want you speaking in tongues. Paul was so much against it, he'd rather say five words than 10,000 words in tongues. Right after he said, I think my God is speaking in tongues more than y'all. Think about it. You talking about cherry picking your scripture. Are y'all here? You go home. It's like verse 18 didn't exist. It's right there. Oh, that didn't exist because he said, then he said, five words of understanding, then, then 10,000 in tongues. He was so against it. I, I've heard preachers preach this on the radio. Heard it. I won't, like, I've heard people say that people said, I heard the preacher preaching it. Because they're anti Pentecostal, charismatic, you know, type people. And so they're, they're finding arguments against praying in tongues or speaking in tongues. And they, they're dishonest. They had to read verse 18 before they read verse 19. Amen. They didn't. They just didn't go, oh, verse 19 says, and just look right above it. They just, oh, that didn't exist. They're being dishonest. You have to take the whole. We get into danger cherry-picking scriptures out to fit our narrative instead of taking true biblical study to the level of finding out what surrounds it, the conditions that were there when they were writing it, why they wrote it, the purpose behind it, all these different things that come involved in Bible interpretation. Because if you don't, you get yourself in trouble. You come up with some loony, loony bin stuff. All right? All right, praise the Lord. So we're going to stop right there. We covered rest. Next week we're going to talk about divine communication with God. I think. Let's give. Amen? Did y'all do okay without worship this morning? All right. Hallelujah. You know, offering envelope, they're on the, in front of you. If you're going to give electronically, you can go ahead and uh, get your cash app ready or your PayPal. Those things are on the screen. There you go. Now they are on the screen. On your, uh, does, that, does that go to the house, to the internet feed, that screen? It doesn't? Okay. But you got something on giving out there? Okay. So we have it out there for those out there or those here in the house. Those are, those are, that's your information for giving electronically. Hallelujah. Do you take? No, I take, we take uh, Cash App and we take PayPal. You don't take such a We take Cash App and we take PayPal. We don't take Apple Pay. Okay? We have two things we use. All right? I mean, you don't? Oh, I don't. Now, if you want to mail a check, well, we receive a check. Okay? 
You want to mail check cash? I don't recommend it. Not everybody working at the United States Postal Service is, is uh, honest. Okay, so dollar sign expedition triad for cash app. Dollar sign expedition triad, one word. PayPal, give at expeditiontriad.org. Give at expeditiontriad.org. That's for PayPal. Again, cash app is dollar sign expedition triad. Amen. All right. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your goodness, mercy. Thank you for revelation that comes out of the Spirit of God. Thank you for leading us and guiding us and taking us into the deeper places of you. Hallelujah. And we thank you uh, for blessing the people as they give. We thank you that heaven's windows are open unto them, and you pour out blessings they don't have room enough to receive. In the majestic and mighty name of Jesus, we declare it as so and say, Amen. Amen. Brother Joe, receive the in-house. Hallelujah. Those giving electronically, hit the, hit the send button. Glory to God. Amen. Um, less than two weeks, and our um, short-term missionaries will be back. Hallelujah. Isn't that exciting? I think it's exciting. Amen. All right. Yes, Penny. Yes. All right. Um, Penny has some people, <laughs> more than one. Hallelujah. You know, the Bible says that God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul. And as much as um, aprons and handkerchiefs went from his body and laid on the sick. Amen. And it healed the sick. And I forgot how it said, it says about the demons. Or, you know, it drove the demons out. Amen. Now, is everybody sick, got a demon? No. But demons can cause sickness. Amen. So in some cases, demons need to be driven out. Well, what does that? The anointing. I said the anointing. Hallelujah. So people can receive healing by laying on hands on prayer cloth. He, see, the anointing is transferable. Obviously, that's what, th that's what the Bible teaches. Hallelujah. I personally have that flow in my life as a minister. Hallelujah. We've seen, new, we've seen marvelous, marvelous miracles take place through prayer cloths. Hallelujah. So just agree with me right here in the name of Jesus. Father, in the name of Jesus, we lay hands on these cloths. We thank you for the transference of the anointing into these cloths. And then when taken to the sick, they're laid on their bodies. The demons are driven out. They're healed in their bodies and made every whit whole in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Regardless of what, what they're dealing with, what they're facing, greater is he that is in me than he that's in the world. And that anointing is now transferred supernaturally into these cloths and will be released, released into the recipients in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Amen. Amen? Hallelujah. All righty. Praise God. Y'all can all stand up. I want to thank all of y'all for joining us today. Hallelujah. Hope you have a great week in the Lord. Love to invite you to join us in person here at Expedition Church of the Triad. We are at 6302 Walter Wright Road in Pleasant Garden, North Carolina. That is at the intersection of Hunt Road and Walter Wright Road. Uh, we, we, we Hunter Walter Wright Road tees into Hunt Road across from Colonial Materials. If you do sheetrock work or you know, construction, you know where that is. We're right across the street. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hunt Road is the same road as Pleasant Garden Road heading out toward uh, NC 62. We are three miles from 62. Hallelujah. Uh, heading toward Pleasant Garden. We're 4.3 miles from Greensboro, uh, exit 124. Elm Eugene, praise the Lord. Come be with us. We'd love to have you. And until we meet again, remember these words from 1 John chapter 5 and verse 4. Hallelujah. Who, what service born of God overcometh the world? And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. God bless you. See you next time here at Expedition Church of the Triad. Good day.